what I'm most notorious for is uh, the theory of multiple intelligences. And so when, and you know, I originally said that there were seven intelligences and now I think there are eight or nine. So when people heard I'd written a book called Five Minds for the Future, they said, oh, Gardner has gotten rid of some of his intelligences. You know, just, <laughs> uh, but in fact, I'm wearing two very different hats in my MI work as opposed to my Five Minds work. Namely, when I was writing about the intelligences, or when I write about them, I'm writing about them as a psychologist. And the intelligences represent my hypothesis about how the mind has, or has evolved over thousands and thousands of years and how it's organized in a sentence rather than there being a single general intelligence. I think it makes more sense to talk about um, a number of relatively <coughs> independent uh, intelligences, plural. This is the list of the five minds, and I'm simply going to um, go through them in orderly fashion. I'm using three senses of the word discipline. One is you know, what your, your parents said, you know, be more disciplined, work regularly and steadily on things. And uh, it used to be that if you worked steadily on things until you got through your education, you could kind of rest on your laurels. But I don't think there's any profession in the world now where you can stop at tw learning at 20 or 25. If you want to keep up, you have to actually remain disciplined. So it's a, it's a lifelong habit, not just something for your time in school. Um, I'll jump to the third one because it's very much in my mind, but it's not so much the focus here today. And that is becoming an expert in some profession, craft, art, or whatever. If you aren't an expert, then either you won't have a job at all, or you'll end up working for somebody who's an expert. And that's not particularly a problem for the people in this room, but it certainly is a problem for many young people who may end up not being expert in anything and then really will be, you know, the, I mean, the jobs for the drones don't exist anymore. Um, it's for people who have some kind of a disciplined expertise. Um, the third sense of discipline, which those of you who have heard this talk before or who've read some of my stuff, no, I'm very obsessed with, are the major ways of thinking that have evolved over hundreds and occasionally thousands of years in what I will call civilization, namely the scholarly disciplines. I typically speak about four of them um, because I think they're the most important ones for pre-collegiate education, which is what you all are involved in in your day jobs, and that's uh, historical, scientific, scientific, mathematical, and artistic thinking. I think those are the major ways of thinking, the major disciplines which we need to inculcate in pre-collegiate education. There's time later on to become a psychologist or a physiologist or a philosopher or some other field, though you know, there's nothing wrong with uh, exposing kids to those disciplines if the more basic ones that I just mentioned are already part of their DNA. I have a book called The Disciplined Mind, which is now already um, you know, almost a decade old. But in that book, I lay out what I think are the underlying mental frames which people need if they want to think like a historian or think like a scientist. And this is a critique of the notion that there's such a thing as thinking in general. Now, that may shock you, but um, I actually, think, I actually think that thinking, um, when it's spoken about generically, needs to be thought about very super, is being thought about very superficially. There are some things which, require, which apply to thought across the board, but once you get into it, the kind of thinking you need to do as a mathematician is very different than the kind of thinking you need to do as a musician, or as a painter, or as a craftsperson, or as a historian, or a geographer. Every, Discipline has its own um, mental forms. And the, the more deeply you get into it, the less you assume that what it takes to be a disciplined poet has much to do with what it takes to be a disciplined chemist. This isn't to say that there are some, that there, are, there may be some poets or good chemists and vice versa, but there's no necessary link between them. You could do chemistry all your life and never write a verse that rhymes and vice versa. They are very different ways of thinking. And, 
This is a heterodox view, which is not one that most people share, but it happens to be right, so I thought I would <laughs> mention it here. Um, I went to a conference in, in Australia this summer, and I got to be thinking about science education. And um, there are at least three different things people could mean when they mean science education. And I would say that the first one has nothing to do with discipline. And that's simply knowing a lot of facts, a lot of information, what my colleague Perkins calls about-itis, knowing something about Venus or something about DNA. Um, and when you're dealing with simply factual information, you're not dealing with the discipline at all. I like to call it subject matter knowledge. And uh, this is uh, kind of difficult to say quickly, but to know a fact in history is no different than to know a fact in geography or a fact in chemistry or a fact in mathematics. It's just a proposition which you memorize. In most of the world, and certainly in most of the United States, what people might think is discipline is really subject matter. Um, but I think there are two other distinctions which uh, were impressed on me in going to this conference. Um, what I've been pushing for for many years is um, you know, a, a scientific education where people um, Learn, out, learn what the scientific questions are, what the most important concepts are, and how to apply them in new situations. That's what I mean by education for understanding. But I think nowadays, and again, this is another heterodox statement, meaning that it would be a great minority who would believe it, um, even though it's right, right? That's the, the new definition of heterodoxy. Um, and that is that probably more important especially in our country nowadays, is understanding um, what the scientific enterprise is about. And I'm calling that meta-scientific knowledge. Knowing that um, science is about building models of the world, testing them. If something's confirmed, you hold on to it. If it's disconfirmed, you um, try to reformulate what you're doing. Um, it's different from a matter of faith. It's different than a matter of opinion. Um, it's a form of argumentation. That's why science was really only invented once, as far as I'm concerned, in the, in the, in the Renaissance, though clearly there were intimations of it in, in classical times. And there's almost no place that focuses on this, and yet it seems to me it's actually more important than the first or the second one. And the reason I think it's more important, and again I'm talking about the American context, is most of the public, and I indeed would say most of the Congress and probably half of the cabinet, doesn't understand what science, what science is and what it isn't. Because otherwise, when you ask the candidates whether creationism should be taught in science class and they raise their hand, that's equivalent to saying that flat earthism should be taught in, in science class. Um, so the, the, the reason for putting this slide up is simply to say that when you say we ought to teach science, that just opens a conversation. But what kind of science you should teach and where the premium should be placed, is very, is very, it's very much up for grabs. Uh, and Courtney was saying on the way over here today, well, you know, you should go along with Letterman and Sharpak, who say first physics and then chemistry and then biology. And I said, well, it's much more important that, I, that somebody know, knows what a scientific claim is as opposed to something that's just a matter of prejudice. The second mind is the one that should be on all of your minds this week, the synthesizing mind. This is a great synthesizer, Charles Darwin. I don't know that he had to be on your mind all this week, but this is what should be on your mind all this week. You're here, and you're being inundated with information. Any one of the talks, and this is the first one I've gone to, you could spend months thinking about. Um, you go home, and uh, you turn on your email, or you go to Google, or you talk to your family, or you read a book, and there's more information there. All of us are being absolutely deluged and inundated with facts, data, disciplines, subject matter, meta, what, 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 what have you. What do we do with all of this? Um, I guess you make the, new, the music very loud. That's one way to, <laughs> de to deal with it. Uh, but the synthesizing mind says, what do I pay attention to? And why? What do I ignore? And why? And then when I begin to pay attention to it, how do I put it together? 
if I can't put it together in a way that makes sense to me, as I walk out of the room or as I walk out of the conference, it's gone forever. Synthesizing means put, putting it together in a way that you can hold on to it, in a way that you can unclutter the riffraff, the fluff, and decide what's really important and put in an arrangement that sticks. And if you're involved in any kind of communication, which by definition teachers are, but anybody who isn't a hermit, you've got to be able to convey the synthesis to somebody else. Otherwise, it's just going to be yours alone. It's a perfect example of being given too much information and having to decide what to pay attention to and what to ignore. You know, whether it's Suarez or Roscoe or Fisher or um, Thompson or Abrahams, everything we say we think is wonderful and we want you to remember every word. But truth to say, if six months from now there's one thing from any of us that you hold on to, that's, that's an achievement. Uh, um, and that, that's because there's way too much. So there's this character in Moliere called Monsieur Jourdain who discovered late in life that he'd been speaking prose all his life without knowing it. This was a great uh, revelation to him. Well, all of us have been doing synthesizing, but um, the notion that this is important, that we should be able to understand how we do it, and crucial thing for teachers, help young people to do it, that's very new. I don't think there's a course on synthesis anywhere that I know. Um, and when I looked at psychology, which is my field, to see in all the textbooks, what do they say about how do people synthesize, there's nothing on it. So that's why I got excited by the synthesizing mind, because um, I said, you know, this is virgin territory. Not doing it. Uh, I mean, the people who I mentioned, uh, you know, maybe Bill above the others, are tremendous synthesizers. But how does one go about doing it? What are the, what's a bad synthesis? You can't talk about a good synthesis unless you know that one isn't working. With your students, unless you have a sense of a bad synthesis, you can't be teaching synthesizing at all. The third mind is called the creating mind. And uh, I've been very interested in what we call big C creativity. One of these is Virginia Woolf. The other one is Einstein. I always have trouble remembering which is which. <laughs> uh, um, and these are icons of, of high creativity, just like Darwin is, I think, the greatest, the greatest scientific synthesizer ever, maybe. Yeah, I mean, just in a class by himself. I mean, you know, Darwin traveled for five years on the Beagle, 20 years corresponded with all the naturalists in the world, raised orchids, raised pigeons, did experiments, became the world's expert on coral reefs, and then literally in his 50s, he published his, his Origin of Species. It's an incredible synthesizing achievement. Um, what's the creating mind? Um, the creating mind, as you all know, is the mind that does something new, comes up with new questions, comes up with new answers, creates new projects, new works of art, solves a long-standing scientific uh, puzzle. That's what the creating mind is. Uh, what I have to add to that is everybody talks about thinking outside the box, right? Um, but you can't think outside the box unless you've got a box. And the discipline, which takes about 10 years, 10 years to master a discipline, though I I'll tell you something at the end, an interesting thing I learned about how you can shorten that. So you can put that in your to be, to be, uh, to be announced uh, category. But basically it takes about 10 years to master a discipline. And um, unless you've synthesized what's known, the chances that you can really do anything new are very, very small. So there's an ordering here, discipline or disciplines, synthesizing, and then outside the box, thinking about something new. Um, because you have to have the box before you can go outside it. Um, the other points which are less well known is that probably what um, characterizes creative minds more than how smart they are in terms of any intelligence is a certain irreverence, a certain tough, challenging temperament, a willingness to fall in your face and when you do, pick yourself up don't feel sorry for yourself and try again. And so if you want to inculcate um, creative mind or spirit in kids, you have to uh, get them to deal with things which don't work out and continue working. 
Um, and that's actually something which certain areas of the United States, like Silicon Valley or Hollywood or Wall Street, are very good at, is, is, is inculcating that, that restless, challenging spirit. And when people from Asia or even parts of Europe look longingly at the United States, frankly, it's not because our 10th grades are so good. It's because we inculcate this irreverence um, and the messages on the street so we don't have to worry about it so much in schools. Uh, the final point, which I take from my colleague Csikszentmihalyi, is you can't decide whether you're creative. Your mother can't decide whether you're creative. Um, it's a judgment made by knowledgeable people and it can take a long time. Uh, people who, they're people who, who one day are, they're people who die without knowing they're creative because the decisions made after they die. Gregor Mendel or uh, Van Gogh. But the good news is you could die thinking you're not creative, but after you're dead, people will decide that. Uh, so you never know for sure that you're not creative. Um, uh, OK, so those are the three cognitive minds, so to speak, um, discipline, synthesize, and creating. The last two minds are the ones that I've been working on with Csikszentmihalyi and Damon, um, each of whom are sort of involved in the Ross enterprise. Um, are ones which don't fall under the cognitive rubric in the usual sense, and those are the respectful and the ethical minds. And the respectful mind is rather easy to describe. The ethical mind is more difficult to describe. But if we just think about this in a school context. Um, one could say, as I guess no child left behind says, but most policies in the world say, you know, school is really about uh, science and math and maybe technology. Um, no history except about why our country is the greatest country, which every country does, and certainly not uh, other, other subjects. But maybe the notion of it being about respect or ethics, that's not in any uh, nation, national curriculum. And maybe it didn't, didn't have to be if these things are inculcated in the community, in religious bodies, and families. But I don't have to tell any of you that those are not very powerful socializing effects in most of the countries that we know anymore. Um, we could talk at length about what religion does and doesn't do, but I'm not convinced that uh, it's particularly tied in our country either to respect or ethics. Another, I'm sure, non-controversial statement on my part. Um, <laughs> The respectful mind, I say, is rather easy to describe. It simply means uh, giving other people the benefit of the doubt, trying to understand them, trying to work with them, and especially so when they don't look like you. We've evolved as a species to know about 150 people who look like us, probably are distantly related to us, and to get along with them. And you know, usually it stops before the killing, though it doesn't stop before the arguing. But uh, you know, we don't live in groups of 150 anymore. Um, and we, this is where globalization becomes so important. In principle, we're in contact with everybody else in the world, even visually, you know, because we can send images. Um, you know, I sit at my computer on a day, and I'll get messages from a dozen different countries, including from Iraq and Iran in places I haven't heard of. Um, I mean, that's incredible. Would have been inconceivable uh, even 20 years ago. Um, so how do we deal with these people? How do they deal with us? Respect begins at birth. The infant <coughs> bonds or doesn't bond to parents, to other significant others, and it sees, he or she sees, how people treat, treat one another, how adults treat one another, how adults treat kids, how kids treat one another. Um, I always claim I can go into a school and within minutes I can make an assessment of how respectful the environment is. And it's not by how I'm treated. In fact, if I'm treated with too much respect, I consider that to be a bad sign, not a good sign. Um, but it's the informal contact, staff with teachers, teachers with one another, teachers with parents, teachers with troubled kids, teachers with kids who are stars and so on. That's how you determine whether the respect um, exists in, in any kind of a community. Now, usually I talk about what I call no cigar, but I left it out in the rest of the talk to shorten it. But uh, I can't leave it out for the respect and ethics. 
One is something that's become very popular in America, both as a phrase and as a practice. Kiss up, kick down. You know, you're nice to people who have power over you um, or who you want something from, and as soon as that stops, you don't give them the time of day, or if you have an extra boot, you kick them. That's not respect. Bad jokes. Like everybody else, or like almost everybody else, I've laughed at jokes at the expense of other groups. I think it's a bad idea. It's a kind of disrespect. Tolerance is obviously better than non-tolerance. Um, Marcel and I were talking last night about Mark Lillis' cover story in the uh, New York Times Sunday Magazine, which I think should be required reading for people, um, where he talks about you know, the complete lack of understanding between religious and non-religious uh, faith and non-faith groups. He says tolerance is the most you can have. I'll certainly take tolerance over intolerance, but I think respect is a better goal. But when you have respect with too many tradition, conditions, you know, I'll respect X if he does A, B, C, D, E, and only that, that doesn't work either. Um, in our disrespectful world, there are some hopeful signs of respect in unlikely places. The Commissions on Peace and Reconciliation, which became famous in South Africa but exist in dozens of countries, um, and various what I would call artistic ping pong. Remember when the United States began to deal with China in the early 70s, it was around sports like ping pong. But it can also be done around music. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma has a very impressive project called the Silk Road Project, which tries to relate the musics along the old Silk Road, which went from East Asia right through to Marco Polo's backyard. And then uh, the late Edward Said and Daniel Birnbaum created a orchestra, still exists, which has kids from the Middle East, particularly from Israel and Palestine, playing together. These are efforts to counter the tremendous forces for disrespect. And something which uh, I think I'll save for the chat with Marcello are issues where I change my own mind about respect having to do with the wearing of scarves in France and the displaying of cartoons in Denmark. You probably all recognize those allusions from the last few years. Which leaves the ethical mind. Now I said ethical is more difficult to talk about than respect. And that's because um, as I define ethics, and this is just my definition, um, ethics requires an abstract attitude. And while we know that infants and toddlers do abstractions, they don't have what I would call an abstract attitude. Um, I don't know whether Kurt talked about the, the higher tiers of development yesterday, T-I-E-R-S, but those are the ones which involve abstraction. And to make it a bit more concrete, I'm Howard Gardner, and I was that ever since I was born. And uh, actually, I, was, I discovered my birth certificate. I was actually Howard Gartner, because uh, my parents came from Germany, and they hadn't changed the name yet. But let's say for the sake of argument, I was always Howard Gardner. Um, and I, if you ask me, what does Howard Gardner think about things, I could always give an answer. But the abstract attitude says I'm not just Howard Gardner. I'm also a scholar, teacher, social scientist. What are my rights, but what, more importantly, what are my obligations in that particular professional role? And I always lived in Scranton, Pennsylvania. I knew that. But that's not the same as having been a citizen. What did it mean to be a citizen of Pennsylvania, a citizen of the United States, a citizen of the Americas, and now in our global world, a citizen of the world, where um, not only can the images and words that I say be instantly transmitted everywhere, and I'm told they're never lost except at the Department of Justice emails. Those get lost, but everything else, every, everything else is preserved forever. Uh, um, but in addition, in addition to that, you know, I, what do I do with my trash? What kind of an automobile do I drive? Do I drive when I could walk or t ride a horse or something like that? These are all citizenship kind of questions. And what are my rights? But more important, what are my obligations? Uh, um, every four-year-old in America knows about rights. And I used to say the first verb that every four-year-old in America knows is the verb sue, because <laughs> you know about suing. But what we don't ask a lot about is, is what are our responsibilities. The ethical mind talks about responsibilities. Um, now you might say, well, but I'm dealing with young kids, so they aren't workers, and they don't belong to a region or to the world. Well, they do. But I think the way to think about ethics in the school is what's your role in the school? 
as a student and as a uh, member of a community. Uh, I think that's the way to, uh, as it were, um, bring it down to the school level. Um, and it doesn't have to be so abstract there because you're there every day. And if, you, if you're working out rules together and you're deciding how to enforce them, then much less abstraction is needed. And in the, in the familiar parlance of developmental psychology, it becomes concrete rather than abstract. This work comes out, as I mentioned, of, of collaboration with uh, Damon and Csikszentmihalyi in what's called the Good Work Project. And when we talk about good work, we talk about work that's excellent technically, that's engaging, and I understand there's been a lot of chatter about engaging here um, at the, this week, but our focus has been really on ethics. Um, what does it mean to be an ethical worker? A worker who is socially responsible, behaves in a way which uh, um, recognizes the fundamental tenets of the profession, whether you're a journalist, a physician, a lawyer, an engineer, an architect, a teacher, there are basic expectations of the role that you should play. So we did a study of good work in young people. And not to put too fine a point on it, the findings were very disturbing. And I have to say that everything other people are reporting, everything other people are reporting, plus my own applied work in the last few years has been very much of an alarm bell for me. To put, to, the headline is, if young kids, maybe meaning you know, 15, 20 and under, have an ethical sense, it's very different from the one that I grew up with. Um, and not to know that as a teacher or a parent or a citizen means that you may be talking right. Well, let me just give you one example. I kind of assume cheating is wrong. In a school that we taught and we worked in this past year, we actually had a seminar on why be honest. Because most of the students saw no reason why you shouldn't cheat. So that's a fairly clear example of where the ethical line is drawn differently. But in a book called Making Good, which several of us published a few years ago, what we found among the best and the brightest, and these were literally the best and the brightest, these would be your cream of the crop in every domain, the kids knew what good work was. They knew what the right thing to do. Some of them did it. Some of them respected people who were good workers, excellent, ethical, engaged. But many of them, whether it was 30% or 40%, we can't precise it, many of them had took the attitude, someday I'd like to be a good worker, I'd like to be ethical, but I can't afford to do it now because I want to be successful. Success in America means fame and power um, and money, they're all joined. And if I am ethical, I'm going to lose to somebody who's cutting corners. And so, someday, when I've made it, I'll be ethical and I'll hire ethical people and I'll <laughs> wa wave the, e, the triple E flag. But in the meantime, uh, I'm not going to be. And sometimes they said this apologetically, but sometimes they said it defiantly. And we were really very shocked by this, um, because it's basically a slippery slope kind of argument. It's an end justifies the means argument. You know, um, a slippery slope means I'm going down one way, but I can change my path someday. Ends justify the means. Someday I'm going to be ethical, so give me a pass now. And I, neither of those things fly as far as, as far as I'm concerned. So I just jotted down some stuff here, which I think would be helpful to educators who take this argument seriously, at least as a point of departure. Number one, even to be aware of these minds. Um, one of the reasons I think synthesizing is interesting is most people haven't thought about that as a skill that they're trying to do themselves and inculcate in their students. Um, so awareness of the five minds, and as I say, respect and ethics, everybody's aware of them, but many people say, well, that's somebody else's business. If I talk to my colleagues at Harvard, I'm sure they would say, and they'd have a good argument, because they're good arguers about why respect and ethics is, is not for the university, it's for somewhere else. Examples from current events. A man who I'd never heard of named Michael Vick. Has <laughs> not, uh, um, but of course, there are examples in history as well. Um, modeling, someone used the word modeling a few minutes ago. 
when we see examples of good work, we talk about them or we model them, then we don't have to talk about them. Um, but also calling attention to negative examples. Um, and as teachers, having consequences for negative examples. One of the shocking things in a course we taught at a, at a, at a school this um, past spring was we showed the Enron movie, the, the smartest guys in the room. How many of you have seen that movie? Okay, not most of you haven't. It's worth seeing. It's a, it's a scathing indictment of the traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-E-R-S, who worked for Enron and all the manipulation they did to get rich themselves and to fool all of California, for starters. Um, and we showed the movie to the class, and the first comment was, it's Gray, da it's Gray Davis's fault. He's the governor. If he'd known what was going on, nothing this, none of this would have happened. The second comment was, well, it's the legislature's fault, because if they hadn't deregulated the price of gas, then none of this would have happened. So at this point, I kind of took off my Tom Mudick uh, uh, <laughs> teacher's hat, and I said, do you mean to say that if either of those things had happened, that what the people at Enron did was perfectly OK? And then the students were a bit cheapish. We didn't have to have a why be honest session. But um, you shouldn't assume that negative examples are transparent to students. They often aren't. When we're thinking about these five minds, we have to wear our hats as, as, as developmental students. And as I argued, you know, discipline precedes synthesizing, precedes creating. And um, respect goes into effect way before ethics can be construed. But remember I said before, it used to take 10 years to become a master. It now takes only five. It's not because of steroids or uh, 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 you know, brain transplants or genetic transposition. It's because of computers. And, so the, and, and Todd Macover, who's a composer, told me kids are already learning to compose much more quickly. And that's because so much of what happened by happenstance before can be quite well controlled through programs that are staggered in difficulty and having access to all the previous games and all the previous compositions. So that's, that's really important for teachers, because if there's so much to learn, if you can learn it more quickly, that's, that's worth doing. The ultimate challenge of personal synthesis, every time I've done an interview on this, on this um, book, people say, well, you know, are you supposed to develop all of them? How do you know you've got them? And so on. And um, I have a shtick on that. But what I want to say is, I think I have one or two more slides, but I'm just going to show one more, um, is that you could have these five kinds of minds, but they don't necessarily fit together comfortably. There is a, a tension between respect and ethics. Because what is there, if there's a person who you feel you owe respect to and you've been respectful to, but you see them doing something immoral, what do you do? The whistleblower pits respect versus ethics. In any traditional society, you respect your teacher and your mentor. But creativity means overthrowing the orthodoxy. So what do you do? So the challenge of putting these five minds together into a single non-schizophrenic uh, mind-body is, is a considerable one. Yeah, I just want to mention this um, because the Good Work Project has been doing social science research for a decade. but. Um, for the, because I'm so concerned, as are my colleagues, about this ethical um, meltdown in, in young people. Uh, and we don't actually know whether it's been better or worse in the past, but it's very bad now. Um, we've actually been developing things to try to work on ethics with, with students. We taught a course of, uh, in college on meaningful work and a meaningful life. We developed something called a toolkit, which is being used um, in high schools, um, and people want it in middle, middle school and in colleges uh, um, in this country and abroad. Um, in the area of, of journalism, which we feel is the, the profession that's most under siege now, we've developed a traveling curriculum, which, which has been used in a third of all the print um, newsrooms in the country, and which is going to be based around the good work ideas. So um, for somebody who's been very comfortably armchair uh, for many years, uh, uh, the, the Good Work Project has mobilized us to actually begin to do um, practical applied work.
Thank, wonderful presentation is always uh, always stimulating. Um, uh, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute because, you know, uh, we deal with students who know exactly who Michael Vick is, and they know. Uh, they live in a culture where the 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 um, consumerism is the end all and the be all, and and they know exactly the kind of cell phone that each person is carrying, and they want to wear it or the certain clothes or drive the certain car. So I know why I feel that having a, a respectful and an ethical mind is important, but I'll play devil's advocate and say for the students, I think the examples that they mostly are presented with are be unethical and be disrespectful because that's how you succeed in life. And that is the way the world seems to be, or, or at least their world and their culture. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how your work or what we should be doing in the classroom is going to uh, make changes on a larger cultural scale. Yeah, well, I mean, I agree with everything you said, so you're not being a devil to me. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, just to use uh, one thing I didn't say, the project began as an exploration of the limits of the market, of, the market, of market models as a model for everything. Um, and we didn't begin the project because we were against markets, but we thought that markets need to be tempered by other kinds of factors, religious, ideological, um, communitarian, and so on. One of the most striking things about young people in general, and this includes my own four children, who are terrific and whom I love, um, is it's very difficult for them to even think about a society in which markets are not the, the dominant factor. And so th this is sort of the baseline at which you start. And you know, in my work on disciplines, I talk about the intuitive theories that kids develop, you know, which are often charming, but they're flat earth kinds of theories, or they are creationist kinds of theories, and how difficult it is to topple that way of thinking and get them to think in a non-creationist, non-intuitive way. It's exactly the same when it comes to markets. If markets are the only way that you think a world can be run, then if you approach, if you expose them, say, to Scandinavia, where markets are tempered, or Reggio Emilia, the community which many of us go to, uh, they, they kind of don't believe it. They say, well, it couldn't be that way. You know? So that's just to reinforce your point. Um, I think that the, and here's I'm going to say something nice about kids, including our kids, often on a very, on a personal level, or even on a local community level, they're quite impressive. That is, they behave trustworthily toward their friends. And if there's some kind of a project where they can be helpful locally, they do so. Um, and it's not even just to get, on, to get it on their college um, admissions packet, though some of them will do it for that reason. The gulf is really, I think, where you put your finger on it. And that's between the people who you know and you see every day or you can help by soup kitchening it, and the rest of the world which could be no bigger than the local department store or Walmarts to the whole country or the whole world. That's where there's an extraordinary cynicism and a belief that you've got to play by those kinds of rules if you want to get ahead. That's where the big gulf lies. Um, John Gardner, who was no relation but was my hero and that of my colleagues, and we dedicated our book to him. He was an American civil servant in the last 50 years, said there are many, many kids in America doing wonderful things locally, but they don't add up because they're disconnected to the political, from the political process. And he said, you're helping 20 or 200. Meanwhile, legislation is being passed or not being passed. It's hurting thousands or even millions of people. Um, so the issue is, what do, you, what do you do there? And I guess you do two things. One, we're trying to do directly now which is at least to create at the local community level, at the school level, the friendship level, the uh, workplace level, an atmosphere which is um, characterized by ethics, because that's more manageable, and then work with people who have a more global or more regional or more national reach to think about how that might be realized beyond the local level. Um, one thing which I'll mention now because it happens to fit in and it'll please Courtney, which occasionally I like to do. Um, we, we've been working on 
ethics in the new digital media. The new digital media is social networks, web 2.0, um, uh, multi-user games, all these things which I can talk about without ever having done any of them. Uh, um, but we're looking at five different areas of ethics. Um, identity, privacy, ownership and authorship, um, credibility and trustworthiness, and participation. Participation means belonging to a community like a social network community. So let me see if I can repeat them again. Identity, privacy, ownership, authorship, um, credibility, trustworthiness, and participation. Why do I mention these? Because every one of these things has to be rethought in the new digital world. When you can present yourself as a thousand different people, when you can you know, buy and sell with disguises, when you can take anything and circulate it and pretend it's your own, when you can join a community and leave it or have six different um, avatars in a community, all the assumptions we've made about ethics in the, in the Paleolithic era in which I grew up have to, be, have to be rethought. And this relates to the question that you've asked, is we have to start where the kids are, but we can't end up there because in many ways they're absolutely confused or what they're doing is disastrous. This is not to say adults are any better, but if we don't understand that the kids think the Enron problem is not the traders, but the, these, these legislators, then we're lost before we start. And if the kids think, okay, let me give you one more example. Um, we used at, uh, um, we're actually getting close to 10, aren't we, Marcella? Well, we started late. Uh, uh, um, Merrily Jones, I want to tell you two anecdotes. Merrily Jones, who remembers who Merrily Jones is? You will as soon as I tell you. She's the MIT Dean of Admissions. How many of you know, right? Um, she was the MIT Dean for decades. I and everybody else thought well of her. I wrote positive things about her. And then she got summarily fired last year um, because um, she had faked her resume. And not just once, but a number of times. So we talked to the students about this. And the prevailing view was, well, what's wrong? She does her job properly. Number two, everybody fakes their resume. At this point, Howard Gardner took off the, <laughs> the Talmudic hat, and the Socratic hat, and said, let me tell you something I said. If you fake a resume, that is instant grounds for dismissal no matter what else is going on. Because whenever you write a resume, you have to sign at the end, this is true factually, and if it's not, I will, the, the employer reserves the rights. So I, so I said, so if you're not going to be honest resume for ethical reasons, which is what the reason you should be, you need to be honest at least for pragmatic reasons, because otherwise you're, you're going to get fired. And this is a revelation, because there's such a What's the word I want? There's, there's such inflation of resumes that people think if you tell the truth in the resume, you're, um, you're holding your, you know, you've got your hands tied behind your back. Now, I want to tell another anecdote. And I remember the anecdote, but um, I forgot the beginning of the anecdote. So I'm going to make up the beginning of the anecdote. Uh, I was talking to 500 students at a private school in Boston, 8 AM in the morning. You know, I talked to groups of celebrities. I don't get nervous. 500 kids, 8 o'clock in the morning, walking with their coffee like this. It was really a tense kind of thing. But they were very polite. You know, they called me Dr. Gardner and all that sort of stuff. So they must have been respectful, right? No, they were, they were a very nice group. So there was some big event that was going on in the world that day. And I asked how many students have heard of it. I can't remember what it was, but I say it was Enron. No student had heard of it. I said, God, these students are really out of it. Then I said to them, how many of you have heard of Kaiva Visnathan? Visnathan? And everybody raised their hand. Now, you haven't heard of her, though again, when I tell you, some of you remember. This was the Harvard student, she was then a sophomore, who had um, published one or two novels and it turned out to be plagiarized. Every student had heard about that because that was on their radar screen. And that's something where they could see how you can get in trouble if you plagiarize. And so if I talked about Enron, or whatever, whatever the thing was that was in the news that none of them had heard of, would have been irrelevant. But they want to go to Harvard. And if they hear that somebody comes a national disgrace, uh, because they're, that, that's going to, so that's a long-winded answer to your, to your question. You've got to start where the kids are, but you can't end there because they don't know the answers either. Thank you.